float in the air. These just do not float in the air. What happens this is the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you act are forever balancing each other. You might be thinking like a Westerner because you were educated abroad, but you and I know that your roots are Filipino. So you know it's wrong to give your drunkard brother money. But when he comes to you and he says, my children won't be able to go to school if you don't give me any money. And you know that if you That's give him money, he's gonna spend it drinking. But you cannot resist because you feel so sorry for your nephews and nieces. So that's why they, we have many Filipino songs that speak of ambivalence. Sana, dalawa ang puso ko, okay? And many Filipino definitions that speak of being torn apart. Ako ay nagdadalawang isip. Ako ay nag-aalinlangan. See what I mean? So this living in a world of ambivalence is very much in our subconscious in our culture. So the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act, these are always, you know, shaped by the culture that we're in, the context that we're in. And so as a psychologist, we take a look at the way we behave, you know, and actions are always, they express the quality of one's life. And so when empowerment is, we speak about it, we look at the quality of the life and you will see that with our three women who will tell you their stories, no? Their work, their relationships, and the way they deal with something bigger than themselves, which perhaps you might call God or the universe or whatever, no? So the quality of your life, how you're able to put that all together is the actions, okay? Now, all of these personal filters, the way you think, the way you feel, the way you act, is usually more or less stable until something sort of, in Filipino, nayayanigga, what makes you need life, okay? And what makes that happen? Random events or what uh, the Jesuit psychologist, Gerald O'Collins calls circumstances and usually he enumerates five of them, like a death of a dream, death of a loved one, you know what I mean? Death of, 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 of hope and ambition, then betrayal, sickness, he says, that happens in everyone's life, exile, a sense of failure, a longing for something more. All of these things happens in your life and shakes you when you least expect, and then, it shifts your attitudes, your beliefs, and your values. And then you begin to question. And then you begin to say, is this what I've been going through all my life? My empowerment? Am I going to continue? Am I going to persist? So these are what we will call the movements, the life condition, okay? So thinking, pag-iisip, feeling, ang damdamin, at ang paggawa. So let's move. Mike Lally talks about empowerment. Empowerment generic is taking full responsibility for the results you get in your life. And you and I know that when we started our lives, we weren't really responsible. We were in a tribal mess. Our families were the ones who were deciding for us. And then later on, we find that we're the one deciding for our families. We usually, if you go and go to go to OFW's, the OFW communities, we see them taking care of a whole barangay of relatives while they're working abroad because they have to take care of their families, send their relatives to school, etc. So the taking of responsibility is not just for their lives, but it's for the whole community. No? This applies to relationships, business, financials, family, friends, health, and any other content. Okay. Once you decide to take full responsibility, you're likely to do something about the results you're getting. And so there is those very unique subtle flavoring, which I come across in the dissertations of many of my students, no? 
that you don't see in other cultures where people will sacrifice their lives, their, uh, care their careers. They will take on careers that they didn't want in order to empower the lives of their families. No? So it, there's a different way of looking at things when you are a Filipino or a Filipina. No? So what is woman empowerment? Woman empowerment, not necessarily Filipino woman empowerment, is the capacity of women to take control of their circumstance, to exercise power and achieve their own goals. This is a very different perspective when you look at it from the West, you know, I'm going to be this particular person despite what my family wants. In the Philippines, I don't see that as an entity alone. It will be, I will be this and for my family as well. There will always be that connectedness, okay? The ability to help themselves to maximize the quality of their lives and then the quality of the lives of their families. That's the additional aspect in our culture, okay? So what are the ways they say, many of the studies are saying, what are the ways to empower women? And then I was reflecting. If you reflect, you see it in, in this group of women, okay, that who are going to be talking to us, no? There are changes in women's mobility and social interaction. For sure, you will see this in this group of women. There are changes in their labor patterns, and you see this in this group of women. If I were to take another group of women from another socioeconomic group, that will be a totally different pattern, okay? Changes in women's access to and control over their resources, okay? And that you will see in this particular socioeconomic group of women. And changes in women's control over decision-making. No? So I can see this in this particular group of women. So, I want you, I, I end this talk, brief talk by saying, bring up the woman again that you had in your mind when we started our conversation. Where does this woman live now? Okay, maybe the woman is you, okay? Who are her significant others? If you notice, we are contextualizing, okay? What is her perception of what is expected of her? What is her family to her? You see, we're beginning to paint a picture. No? What will she prioritize? Or you answer that in your mind, no? Because at the end of the day, that is what is important to her. And what is important to her, that will give the context and that will be the basis of the empowerment, okay? So I end this talk by saying, a woman is the full circle. Within her is the power to create, sorry, to nurture and to transform. Thank you. So we're done. Wow, Dido, thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, for the that, title. Was a, okay. <laughs> that was a very insightful and an eye open. It is an eye opener to the understanding of what empowerment truly means in the context and putting it together in really our Filipino culture and our Filipino beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so um, to move on, I just want to um, inform the group that our current population now is roughly 110 million Filipinos and still counting. And women comprise about 49.8% of the population. Can you imagine that's a whole lot of women? And if all women were empowered, we can really truly run this country the way it should be. And the best man on the job, is really a woman. 
So today's webinar really focused on the Filipina. And we have a minuscule number of three women who will represent three different age groups and sectors in our society who are willing and graciously willing to share their beautiful and inspiring life stories on how they value the value of their self-worth, will share their ability to determine their own choices through their learnings, how they thrive through and blossoming and continue to blossom in the place, in their own place and with their stories can influence social change in their own small space. So again, we have three speakers who will talk on her workplace, her marketplace and the community. Let me share. Our first speaker is the youngest of three storytellers who will represent the sector of women in the world. I did not receive it, there was no one. So one, she... Okay. She is a graduate of the Philippine Science High School in 2010. She pursued her BA in economics, magna cum laude at the George Washington University in Washington, DC in 2014 and uh, continued to pursue a law career and graduated with the Juris Doctor Cum Laude at the Notre Dame Law School in South Bend, Indiana in 2019. And together uh, com completed a master's in business administration from the University of Notre Dame, Mendoza College of Business, South Bend in 2019. Interestingly, she was the president of the student body senior year at the Notre Dame Law School. And during the graduation, she was the commencement speak. She was the speaker during her graduation and she received the community citizenship award from the Notre Dame Law School, which is an award given to the member or to the student with the greatest contribution to the lives of the Notre Dame law students and in making Notre Dame Law School a better place. After her graduation, before she entered the law firm that she is currently in, she was a big proponent for values of diversity and inclusion and was a scholar, part of the Leadership Council on Legal Diversity. Currently, our speaker inspired and empowered is a managing associate of the Sidley Austin LLP law firm that focuses on corporate transactions, including mergers and acquisition, private equity, securities and capital markets. She advises clients also on corp corporate governance matters. And she maintains an active pro bono practice, working with National Immigration Justice Center to help reunite refugees and asylees um, with their families and obtain permanent residency status. Our speaker, storyteller, is a natural born leader, a breast cancer survivor and thriver an avid golfer, mountain climber, a biker, a health buff, and now recently a bunny slope skier. skier. Friends, I am proud to present my youngest daughter, Athena Aherera. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Make it a bit louder, Anna. Okay. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mom, for that 
I was obviously cringing the whole time. If you guys could see my face, I'm just embarrassed to see all of that. But I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you for for joining this call. I think um, the month of March is very important because it's Women's History Month. So I'm very excited to just be here to sort of share about very briefly my background, who I am, um, just so you could get to know me and to sort of set the stage for our discussion about empowerment or women empowerment in a workplace. So I won't, I won't talk too long about myself, but just to give you an idea of who I am, um, I am obviously, I was born and raised in the Philippines. I currently live here in Chicago. I moved to the US about um, 12 years ago. So I moved here for college, but backtracking a bit, um, you know, I, I think when I was a kid, I generally was very active. Um, I was involved with a lot of sports. Um, I like being around friends. I was very close to my family. I still am to this day. And I'm also very close to my grandparents. I know my grandmother's on this call too. And I have no shame in saying that I'm her favorite. So um, that's something I'm very proud of. And, you know, I went to Assumption College for my grade school. And I think I did well enough in school so that, you know, my parents suggested that I move and try to see if I could move to Philippine Science High School, where um, some luck I was able to pass. And so I, I moved to Pisai, that's what it's called. And that was, um, for high school, that was a very, you know, challenging time for me because it was all like advanced math and science courses, but, you know, and it was an experience, an eye-opening experience for me because a lot of the people who I got to know there or my classmates were way smarter than me. Um, but, you know, even in high school and even when I was in Assumption, I was also very involved with the student government. Um, so that was something that was always passion. That was something that I was always interested in and which is why I stayed consistent in doing that when I was both in Assumption and when I went to Pisai. Um, you know, after I, after high school, I think what happened was my parents, again, through their support, sort of pushed me to move to the States to pursue, a, to pursue a degree in the States. And um, that was an interesting and exciting time for me almost 12 years ago, because obviously it was a completely new culture and a new experience and having nobody here that like all my friends are back home was also a, just a daunting experience initially. Um, but, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I also loved the fact that I was able to meet people who had different ideas from me. I think that was the benefit, the biggest benefit for me about coming to the States is, you know, you have people who think differently from you. And because of that, in your conversations, in the things that you learn about different people, like it challenges you to also think outside your box. Um, and of course, the other thing that I find very interesting about just from my move from the Philippines to the US is, Obviously, as what Dr. Dito said, like I, you know, I'm still a Filipina. I was born and raised, but, you know, you go through certain changes and, you know, right now, like my mindset is not just, my background is not just a Filipina. Like I'm, I think differently. I, um, I, I'm still 100% like a Filipina, but I also have like a diversified approach mindset which it, I attribute to just you know from the fact that I moved here um, so anyway I to sort of move things along to describe how I got to where I am today I didn't know there was no one aha moment for me that really pushed me to become or decide that I wanted to be a lawyer um, it was just a series of circumstances and a series of events that sort of aligned perfectly and which ultimately propelled me to want to become one. I also reflected and understood what my current skill sets were and what my interests were. And one of them primarily being, I love talking to people. I love meeting new people. 
Um, I think learning new things is interesting. And you can say that, that there are different professions that can give you sort of that um, experience. But if I was being honest with myself, I knew that I wasn't going to be a doctor. I was also very afraid of blood. <laughs> and I knew uh, coming from Pisai where science was interesting for me at that time, but it shifted when I, when I moved to the States. Um, and so, you know, I also, before I decided to go into law school, I worked at a law firm and that confirmed sort of my idea that I wanted to become a lawyer, um, not for anything else. Like I think the lawyers that I worked with at the time, I enjoyed and I really thought that what they were doing was interesting. Um, so then I moved to Notre Dame. That's where I went for law school. And of course, I, again, I still maintained like a very active, um, I was still very active in the student government when I was there. Um, I knew I, when I was in law school, I didn't want to be a litigator. So I'm, I'm a, the kind of lawyer that actually doesn't go into court. Um, I, I don't do that. If I do do that, then that means I'm not doing my job correctly. Um, so I'm in the transactional space. So, you know, I knew that I wanted to be involved in the business side. And that's the part of the reason why I decided to get an MBA so that I could learn the language and sort of set myself up and diversify my skill set in and to help me, you know, prepare myself to for a pra the practice of law as a corporate attorney. Um, you know, in law school, it was also very challenging. I, for, by some miracle, I passed and, you know, I passed the bar also. I did well enough. I, you know, even before I got to where I am today, the, the whole process of trying to apply a, to the job that I'm currently in was very difficult. Um, this, this is like my dream job, Ben, but before I even got here, you know, I received a ton of rejections. I didn't, I, there were many points where it was disheartening um, just because the process of trying to get into a law firm is very competitive here. And so, you know, I think there were a series of things also that helped me get to where I am today. Obviously my family being supportive there and then me leaning on certain mentors and also the very important thing is, you know, just believing in myself and just, you know, continuing to push on. Um, and so when I finally got to the job that I'm currently in, of course, when I started, I knew that I knew what the expectation was. When you start at a law firm, just to give you guys background or in any job, I, I suspect, you know, the expectation, at least for the junior attorney, is that you have to be available 24 7. And I knew that. And um, I knew that coming in. And the other thing that I knew was I wanted to work hard enough um, to do well there and to sort of prove myself as a junior. Um, the other thing was, you know, I, given that I knew how rigorous the process was, I was thinking to myself, this is something that I didn't want to, like, I don't want to mess it up. I want to make sure I do everything that I can that to, to ensure that I do a good job that um, hopefully I can succeed. And what that entailed uh, for me was working ridiculous amount of hours. Like I, I really worked a lot and I still do to this day, but that all changed um, when I got sick. Obviously when I had breast cancer, that sort of shifted and turned my whole world upside down. Um, and, you know, I'm obviously in a, a better spot now. I, I have been able to get to a point where I've been able to move forward. And of course I took time off, um, from work and, but now I've returned to work. And so I'm at this juncture where I'm sort of figuring out how to, how to advocate for myself, considering that, you know, at, when I first started, all I was doing was working. All I was doing was, you know, trying to um, work hard enough, which at many times came at my expense. So now that I've actually returned to work, I've sort of shifted my perspective and reprioritized things in my life. In particular, the first one being my health. So um, yeah, that's that's just a lot that that went on longer than when I wanted to, you know, when I wanted to say, but that is just to give you a background of sort of where I am, where I'm at, um, and like the current situation that I am working with. So I didn't know if there were any questions um, that you 
if anyone is interested in asking a particular question, I'm happy to answer. May I ask a question? Hi, it's nice to meet you. Hi, it's, hi uh, I'm your mom's friend. <laughs> so, so I'm Ivy Almario. You all, all of your life are going, um, it seems like achieving your goals was very quite natural for you. And we all know really that those who make it look easy backpedal and really do a lot of work to achieve what we do. Somehow we just, somehow because of who we are, perhaps we make it look easy. So my question is when you got your um, cancer diagnosis, how has, how devastating was it? Because you are so young. How did you deal with that? Uh, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm happy to speak about it for sure. Um, I think now we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Thank you for the question. Yeah, of course, I'm happy to, to, to answer that. Um, yes, of course, I thought I was going to die. I think everyone who gets a cancer diagnosis <laughs> in some way, shape, or form is, you know, has the belief that they're going to die. And of course, that was a very scary situation for me. Um, and I think, you know, I, it was, it's very funny because even when I first got my diagnosis, it, this sounds very crazy, but the first thing that I thought of also was, you know, of course, I didn't know what that meant if I was ever going to be able to return to work, what that meant for me. There are many unknowns. And even right now, because, you know, of course I'm not in my active treatment, but I am still working through the remainder of what's left on my treatment plan. I don't know, I don't have a, I never had a clear answer of like how things were going to work out for me. So I think one, um, of course, when I was sick, I took time off. Um, I was out for almost a year from my job. I made sure that I, I immediately talked to the people who needed to know on a, a need to know basis at my at my firm. Um, so the head of the firm, and then obviously I a lot of a lot of the recovery and the support that I got was from family. So that without that, I don't think I would be here today. Um, but from like a practical standpoint, just from in um, in the context of work. I needed to figure out how I was going to be able to, because um, the other thing was, since I wasn't working, you would assume that I wasn't going to get paid. But one of the things that was important to me was I needed, I needed the money so that I could pay for my treatments and, and all my medical bills. And so that was one thing that I needed to figure out, which was to, you know, find what were the resources at the particular firm that I was at and figure out what it meant if I took leave if they could um you know once I left and I decided to come back to the firm when I was well enough would they would I still have a job so those are just the, some of the things that I considered um thinking of and you know unfortunately like with anything that happens to us there's no guidebook that tells you this is what you should do so it's just learning to seek out resources and not be afraid to speak up um, and find people who will, you know, take an interest in you. I think that was one of the things that helped me um, sort of navigate the situation that I was dealing with. Great, thank you so much. I hope that answered your question, <laughs> sorry. I have a question. Um, knowing that your the health issue has impacted your life now, how do you see yourself in the next five to 10 years? with your goal now as a, as your career goal and with this health issue hovering around you? So um, I, as I mentioned like earlier, you know, when I first started, when I was a junior, my whole mindset was I'm ready to work 24 seven. It's okay if I sleep until three in the morning and wake up at six and do it five times a day, which is fine. There are people who do that who And I, that's, that's their, that's their prerogative um you know every ever since i returned to work keeping in mind like i think how i in order for me to think about how i plan my life in the next five to ten years i had to think about the present and think about what my specific priorities were 
So that took a lot of self-reflection and thinking about what do I need now? What is most important to me? And currently, of course, as a woman in at my at my law firm, it's a male dominated industry. Of course, I have aspirations of wanting to succeed and you know be one of the first women to be there for whatever it, reason it is. But for my health is my number one priority. So that's where I start. I start with my health and um, I think about what other things come next to that. Health being the number one priority, I want to make time for, let's say, my family. I'm not married. I don't have kids. So it's, you know, I want to spend time with my parents, my sister, my grandparents. I want to be able to go home to the Philippines. Um, I also want to have time for my specific interest. And of course, the other main thing is I have a lot of utang from being a, you know, a law student. So I have to pay my bills. So, and I, you know, I also have to pay my medical bills and for all my continuing treatment. So those are things that, you know, thinking about my priorities and then putting them into context now. And then it's hard for me to say what I want to do for five to 10 years. That was my initial perspective. But with what happened to me, I've learned that you sort of have to take things day by day because things can change. You're, if you're one day, because it, it just depends on what season of life you're in. Um, for me, I thought, you know, all I had to do was just work. I, I initially thought I was just going to be working for the next five years. And, um, you know, I didn't know I was going to get sick. So, but that changed things for me. And, you know, that shifted everything else in my life. Um, not necessarily, I don't believe that it was, you know, I was starting from scratch or anything like that. Like, I think I was just beginning from experience from that point on. Athena, there's a question from Tita Yvette. Yes. Hi, Athena. Hi. I'm Yvette. So um, my question is going through all this and discovering, finding out, and then go, now where you are, what is the greatest thing that you have discovered about yourself and that you can also share as empowering um, experience or something that you discovered about yourself that you can share with others, especially women at the, um, within your age? Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's a, that, that's a very good question. And it's something that I, um, you know, for, in self-reflection, the self-reflection that I've done recently, um, I've discovered that I can actually put myself first because originally when I started, I was not putting myself first. I was putting my job first. And I think women tend to do that in general. Women always put other people before them themselves. I'm not a mother, but I know my mom. She put us like her kids, you know, our needs before hers. And I think just women in general do that. They, that's just mother, mother nature. It's, um, you know, but I, and what I've learned throughout this experience is that like if from a health perspective, for instance, if I'm not okay, then I can't perform. So then, you know, you have to think about doing things that benefit you, that help you so that you can achieve your goals. Like you are your number one, your best advocate. So if you're not a hundred percent, then no one can help. Like if you can't help yourself then no one else can. So I think that was one big self-reflection that point for me, um, you know, going through all of this, that you have to prioritize your health and yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tita Jessica. Um, has a question for you. Go ahead, Jess. Should I put the video? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Athena. Hi. I am your Ninang. <laughs> okay, nice. as, a, as a background, um, I am Sammy Ajerera's classmate in AIM, and we are part of the Rotten Group. Okay, of friends for 40 years. And Nabi is my ob who took care of me because I gave, I was, I got pregnant at 41. Okay. So now go back to you, Athena. I'm so proud of you and what you've achieved. You know, how young are you now? I'm 29. Ah, 29. 1980. I think I was 27. I was also die. I was uh, I was like after AIM. I took on a brand management career, worked twelve hours a day, worked my butt off, traveled every week, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
One day, my dad said, you're so thin. Have a CT scan before I leave for the US. Okay, had the CT scan and oops. Oh my gosh. Dr. Sarmiento said, hey, Kim, there's no cure for lymphoma. I said, shit. And then <laughs> I said, oh my golly. And then he said, but it's good thing it's stage two or something. My dad said, don't worry about it. On top of that, I got laid off because Unilever took over Kraft, okay? There was a big acquisition. So here you are, your career, you know how it is. Wow, I have my car, la la la, I'm gonna buy my flat, etc. So I took time off from work and my father said, you know, have faith. And funny enough, he took me to church every day even if I didn't want to go to church, okay? And then he said, there's no cure for that, but there's this homeopathic doctor I will take you to, you know, so in White Plains. So I did go to him, okay? And I took a vegetarian diet diet for two years. Your, like your health was there, the health was the priority. Pero I think most importantly was just like you, we need to treasure the support of our parents I know Nabi will be crying now because <laughs> it's really the core, you know, the family thing. And uh, I'm glad you're, you're immersing yourself in that. And then the, mo the next thing is the faith. You know, the job can just stop for a while. It will always be there because you're only 29, 27, 29. Yep. So that's what I can share. And then I went back to work, you know, uh, joined, I was a co-owner in a graphic design company, cha-cha-cha, concentrated on my career, finally got married at 41, got pregnant. Then I see your mother. I said, I think I'm pregnant. I cried. I said, what will, I hope, you know, I'm so scared my baby will be retarded because I'm going to give birth by the time I'm 42. She says, don't worry, I'll take care of you. So You're it's fine. about faith and then the empowerment of women around you who believe in you, you know what I mean? Your husband. So that's it. Cut long story short, I had a kid. She had scoliosis and I, I set aside everything he, here in Hong Kong. You know, I ran a business at the same time, took care of her. We would go, she was braced up. And then she, I said, Anna, you try to set up a support group in school. She was 10 years, 11 years old. She set up a, a scoliosis support group in her, in her university, in her, in her school here in Hong Kong. And that worked well. Anyway, and now she's in New Zealand. She still has her scoliosis, but she's doing well. And I should hook you up with her and you can share your, your stories. Yeah. Anyway, Athena, yeah. I'll, I'll cut this short and you know, you go for it. Okay, Thank but you. don't lose faith. And you know what? Your mommy, she's so makulit. All mommies are makulit. My daughter said, mommy, you're so makulit. But what makes you so unique? You're Filipino. Filipino yes. moms are so makulit because she and her friends in university and they say, Anna, why do you always pray? Why do you have your medal here? Uh, did your mom say to you, for you to wear your Jesus there? <laughs> so they, they ne you oh. never forget your roots and that's great. Okay, Thank keep you, it up. Jessica. Thank you very much for the okay. inspiring talk on, on um, Filipinas. Go, and go, the faith. go. Yeah. yeah the faith. Okay. Thank you. Athena, there is one question. On a lighter note, apart from the hobbies that were presented as a health buff, what is your comfort food and your stress busters? It's good to know you're back at work. <laughs> um, well, I eat a lot. I eat anything. Oh, Pinoy's love to eat and Pinay's love to eat. Um, my comfort food sinigang. So <laughs> that, um, that's what I love to eat. Anything with rice. Um, and these stressors, I, I like to take walks now. Um, it's easier for me to squeeze in. Um, and that really helps me. I also, you know, for my mental health, I 
also speak to a psychologist. She, we developed a relationship when I first got sick. She specialized in women who had breast cancer in young adolescent women. And so we've maintained the relationship. And so I have a standing like meeting with her and, you know, that really helps me de-stress because it gives me an opportunity to really reflect and think about how and helps me provide, it provides me with strategies to, you know, cope with stress and anxiety or whatever it is that I have going on. Okay, we will reserve the other questions after the, um, the speakers have given all their, um, their stories. Thank you, Athena, for that awe-inspiring and moving life story. Okay, now we shall move on. Our next speaker is an entrepreneur, mother of three amazing boys. She has a background on diverse business and entrepreneurship. She learned the facts of life at the age of 10. High school valedictorian who lived independently by the age 16 and a millionaire at the age of 23. She is an accountant and a financial analyst, a president and treasurer, finance officer of multiple uh, corporations, to name a few, Web Focus Solutions Incorporated, Kingson Prime Technology, Kingson Management and Development Corp, treasurer and chief finance officer of the Ability Telecom Services, Inc. The inspired and empowered storyteller now is an unconventional thinker. She's an active learner of metaphysics and astrology. She is skilled, driven, passionate, spontaneous. She believes in the importance of self-companion. She is definitely the survivor of the fittest. My friends, let us welcome Eileen Melegrito. Eileen? I'm I'm good. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Nabi. So I'll just give you a brief background, no? Uh, why I was invited by Dr. Herrera here, Dr. Nabi here. So I was a patient. I am a patient of Dr. Nabi. Um, I met her when I got pregnant, at age 30, 33 years old or thirty-four. I couldn't remember exactly, but I think um. She's, she told me, when she told me that, uh, she asked me if I can um, speak here and be a speaker, I immediately said, sure, yes. Because I love, I love telling my story. I love hearing stories. I love to be inspired and I love to inspire people also. So, um, to... Because of love of stories, you know, I like, I like to talk, I like to talk a lot, I, I like to be heard. When I was, uh, I'm going to share the story when I was uh, giving birth uh, for my first child, no? I was on the cesarean, uh, I, I was, uh, I, I went through cesarean operation, no? I was on the operating table. I've been talking and talking, telling my stories. So when they injected me the, the anesthesia, and they're trying to pick me, you know, just to check if I can, I can still feel, you know, or the, the anesthesia has kicked in, you know. I keep on talking and talking and then they sliced me, you know, they, they cut me. And then I, I was, ouch, <laughs> you know, because of, um, I was too engaged in talking. I couldn't, you know, I, 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 I missed the, 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 I mean, I miss the. Okay, hey, I'm I'm uh, sorry, sorry about that. So, anyways, um, Eileen, relax. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm gonna be <laughs> relaxed now. This is not the first time I'm gonna tell uh, tell the story about my life. I've been telling people, my especially my friends, about my life. No, so I am thinking uh, I'm thankful for the speech of Dr. Villasor. So I will go through some notes. 
I have not prepared for this speech, but um, I will go through the context of what Dr. Dr. Villasor has discussed earlier. So I'm going to tell you um, uh, how 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 I become who I am today. What uh, made me who I am today? So um, last week I met with my with some of my friends, you know, and one of them is a dermatologist. She's a doctor, and she told me, "I din nakakainis kay uh, ang ganda ganda mo pero the way you dress up or the way you walk." Parang lalaki. But there's a reason behind it, no? Um, I grew up in a family of eight, middle child. So I have two older brothers and one younger brother. So I'm the fourth child, no? So during our younger years, when I was a child, they are my playmates, no? And they always say, Eileen, um, you cannot join because you're a woman. You're a girl. Hindi ka pwedeng sumali sa laro namin. Mo, kapag lalabas sila, um, they don't want to bring me along or tag me along kasi they say, ang bagal mo maglakad. Mga, mga ganun. So, I remember my childhood na palagi akong nag-iisa, solo. I remember um, a great part of my childhood na palagi akong nagtalakad na nagtalakad. We live in a village, no? a secured village. And, um, gated village with, um, with neighboring villages. So I remember myself na lagi ako naglalakad pupunta ako sa iba't ibang villages. Nangangapit bahay ako pupunta ako sa mga friends ko, sa mga classmates ko. And um, nakikipag-usap ako sa mga kapit bahay ko na older sa akin. Because nung bata ako, parang nararamdaman ko na parang ay, hindi ka pwedeng... Uh, sumali sa amin because you're a, you're you're a girl so parang kailangan kailangan ko maghanap ng ng na ibang makakausap you know so ang uh, bata pa lang ako independent na ako eh so parang um may sarili ako ng ano uh, I, i feel like i'm a different uh kid no from among my ano my same age group no I remember na very competitive ako. Pag sinabi ng mga kapatid ko na, oh, akit tayo ng puno. Oh, dahil payat ako, akitin ko yung pinakamataas na part ng puno. Dahil kaya ako ng branch na kahit yung papayat na branch na kaya pa ako eh. So, very competitive ako in a way na kung anong kaya gawin ng mga brothers ko, kailangan gawin ko din. Sa so school, um, ang, ang, ang time namin would be 7.30. I come early. Like, one of my classmates asked me, sabi niya, I think what time do you go to school? Sabi ko, 6.30. And then the following day, she was earlier. She came earlier than me. So I said, oh, okay, so tomorrow, mas maaagahan ko pa. So I don't like, I, I, at that time, I didn't like, you know, losing. I didn't like, I was very competitive. I remember na, I was part of the quiz B competition. So that was four subjects, no, in on a stage with different, like first, uh, first year level to fourth year level high school, two representatives in each level. So I won the overall, I won as overall champion in all four subjects. And uh, my best friend's father approached me, and he said, "Kung naman di mo pilagbigan yung best friend mo, kahit isang subject lang, hindi mo naman siya pilagbigan man ano." So that time, was, I was thinking, I, I have to do my best. Eh. It's not about, uh, it's not about giving giving way to my, ano, no, to, to thinking about my friendship or my best friend, but it's about doing my best, you know. So that part, nung, nung bata ako, very, ano na ako, eh, very, very, I know na, very focused na ako. Meron akong, um, meron akong um, goal. Meron na talaga akong gustong ma-achieve. And uh, one of my um, inspiration is my father. Kasi daddy's girl talaga ako. So I like hearing stories. And um, I asked, one day I asked my mother about my father. So she told me na, 
um, he is the eldest child. Nung nakilala ko yung father mo, he was very poor. Um, he, he, we were in college. He couldn't even uh, afford to buy his snacks. Ililibri ko pa siya. And then, uh, parang self-supporting siya. So, parang it inspired me in a way na parang, uh, no matter what ano struggle mo, diba, you can always uh, survive. Kasi ang father ko is, uh, is, is a professional who works abroad. And um, that time, I seldom see him, no? Once a year, mauwi siya. And then, uh, um, naalala ko, nagpapagalak siya ng package, like, balik bayan box, he would send four pieces of um, cars. Kasi, inisip niya, para walang inggitan sa mga, mga, mga magkakapatid, lahat na lang kayo, cars na lang ibibigo sa inyo, lahat na napapadalak sa inyo, cars. So, na build up yung ano ko yung mentality ko na parang parang mas okay maging lalaki no parang mas okay na na mag, maging at par with men you know dapat hindi natin nililimit yung sarili natin na na ito lang yung kaya nating gawin because babae tayo no so um during high school that was when um, the struggle started. No? Um, my family broke up. We went to financial crisis. And um, I was able to continue to uh, study because of scholarship. I was given scholarship for four years. And then I graduated by the Victorian. That time, um, I was so focused na parang uh, kailangan maiba yung buhay ko eh. Hindi pwedeng ganito na lang. Like, my siblings, they all stopped from going to school, no? Because they, my parents cannot send them to school anymore. So, ako, nag, dahil scholar ako, um, nakapag-aral ako, but ang tumulong sa akin talaga ay yung mga kaibigan ko. After school, pupunta ako sa bahay ng kaibigan ko. Doon ako mag magdi-dinner. Tapos, I remember, meron akong classmate na, na um, hindi niya gusto masyado mag-aral, no? And kailangan ko ng scientific calculator. And then, doon sa, sa shelves ng sa, sa school room namin, nakakita ko ng scientific calculator. And then, I know that it belonged to my classmate. No? So, I asked, I told him na, Oh, Ramon, this is your, ano, this is your calculator. So, sa'yo na. You know, parang, yung mga bagay na wala ako, because at that time, mahirap kami, wala kaming pera, na, na provide sa akin ng mga kaibigan ko, ng mga classmates ko, so, parang na na, na na realize ko na parang thankful pa rin ako na talagang marami ako mga kaibigan na tumulong sa akin. And um, uh, I graduated by Victorian and after that, nag, um, nag, ano na ako, nag, nabuhay na ako mag-isa. Like, I mean, I, independently, I went to a dormitory and um, I started earning so I do I did trading. So umpisa umpisa nag um nag nag nagbabay and sell ako. Lahat ng pwede kong ibenta ginyan ako like uh, RTW sell big dahil um nakatira ako sa isang ladies dormitory so kung wala ako sila ng LRT bibili ako ng mga damit tapos binibenta ako sa mga dormitories ko sa mga roommates ko. So that time at age 16 meron na akong three bank accounts. Kasi parang um, nag-earn na ako ng pera eh. So, kailangan lahat ng... Like, the parents of my friends, they, they, they like me kasi sabi nila, Aileen, um, ang serve na binake mo, okay. Parang they patronize me. Parang they... It's a way of helping me eh. So, nung... Um, nag-start... Uh, so, I was able to graduate college na, no? And then, I started working. So, I started working in a bank. Sobrang baba ng sweldo. So, I was thinking, paano ko makakatulong sa pamilya ko nito kung ganito lang, ganito lang kababa yung sweldo ko? Parang sa sarili ko, pakulang na. And then, um, nag-start ako mag-trade ng sea cucumber. Uh, for those who doesn't know um, yung sea cucumber, when we go to Hong Kong, may makita kayo mga naka-jars doon. Parang mga naka-jars na, na mga nasa tubig, that's si cucumber eh. So I started trading si cucumber. Itong si cucumber na to, 
um, kailangan kong pumunta sa different islands of the Philippines. No? Uh, kailangan kong pumunta doon sa isang island na kahit generator wala. Kailangan kong puntaan yung mga divers. Kailangan ko silang sunduin. Like, bring them to Samar or bring them up to Palawan. So, um, nagtatayo ako ng buying station. A buying station. And then, nag-hire ako ng local people para to do the, the, the process of, you know, um, preparing the sea cucumber for export. So, na-meet ko dito ang uh, maraming mga, like, different kinds of people na parang itong industry nito parang mostly dapat lalaking gumagawa eh. Because I I go to islands, I don't even I don't I don't even know how to swim. One time I experienced na gabi-gabi na nabutas yung bangka namin. I had to go back to the city. It, it was too dark. Parang feeling ko nakasakay ako sa surfboard. Parang I was thinking na parang katulad ko na to eh. Parang uh and uh, bakit ko ba to ginagawa bakit bakit ito yung pinapasok kong business di ba parang for me kailangan ito kasi yung ano eh um, mas mabilis yung ano eh reward eh mas i mean ROI eh mas mabilis yung kumita nagmamadali ako that time nagmamadali ako na kumita ng gumawa ng pera because meron na akong binubuhay na family so at age 20 Three after graduating college, kailangan ko na i-prove, kailangan ko na tulungan yung mga kapalit ko. Because I was the only one who graduated eh, di ba? So yung mga, kla- mga kapalit ko na nag-stop, hindi pwede naman na sila, ako lang yung nakapag-aral, kailangan ko din silang tulungan ng mga pag-aral. That's the family of, ano, concept of Filipino family, di ba? So tinutulungan natin yung mga siblings natin, we, we take responsibility. So tinulungan ko yung, so that time, tinut- ang, ang aim ko is parang to make money. And then, bumalik ako dun sa memory nung bata ako na my father is a, an of, on OFW. Ang mother ko, she receives a, an allotment of around 27,000 during 1980s. Malaki nung pera yun, di ba? Pero naranasan ko na nangungutang kami sa kapitbahay namin. Na nangungutang kami dun sa isang kapitbahay namin, helper, na ang asawa niya is a gardener. Iniiwanan siya ng 100 pesos para sa daily expense niya. Tapos inuutangan namin kasi nga wala kaming pera eh, wala kaming like parang ang hirap-hirap ng buhay namin although we live in a village, we're renting a we're renting a property, pero na experience ko na pinapalayas kami sa bahay dahil we cannot pay the rent. So ang dami-dami kong mga pinagdaanan nung uh, bata ako na I think na parang na I believe na parang it shaped me up, no? Na parang because of this um, situations, it helped me na parang maging independent, ma, ma, maging, be, be responsible, no? It helped me to become an independent, be responsible, take responsibility, and very focused lang ako na kailangan may, ma- may marating ako sa buhay. So, ang inspiration ko din is, is yung father ko. Naalala ko when I was a child, no? Maraming books yung father ko. And nakikita ko sa mga books, PhD. So, parang bata pa ako, parang wala pa ako seven years old. Hinahatanong ko yung helper namin. Sabi ko, ano yung ibig sabihin ng PhD? Sabi ko ganun. I want, I want to become uh, someone na may title na PhD. So and then nung nung mga in grade school naman ako sa 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 yearbook they always tell you na oh, sige ilalagay mo kung anong gusto what you, what you want what, what you want to become di ba in the future ang nilagay ko doon I want to become a CEO So bata pa lang ako alam ko na kung ano kung anong gusto kong gawin regardless of the situation nung time na may pera kami nung time na wala at wala na pera I know what I want to become and um, but I didn't have the access to good schools, to good universities. Because bata pa lang ako parang ano nila, eh, I'm on my own. Eh. I have to decide on my own. Eh. See, mother ko, okay, kung ano gusto mong gawin sa buhay mo, then do it. So I, did, I didn't have access to good school or um, to good universities. So when I started um, studying, I was also in, in scholarship and I have to, to provide for myself, ba? So, 
nung nung naka-graduate na ako, na-realize ko at early stage na like nung naghihirap na kami, na-realize ko na it's not about how much you have. Kasi kami, ang mother ko may allotment na that time na 27,000, I think is malaki na, no? Tapos nangungutang kami sa isang helper na ang ang, ang allowance na every day is 100 pesos. Can you imagine? So I, I realized early na parang it's not how much you have, but how well you spend your money. Diba? So, um, nung nasa trading business na ako, I met some mentors. And um, he's a follower of Bo Sanchez. And Bo Sanchez, Bo Sanchez is a speaker who talks about, you know, this topic of psychological wallet. What is your psychological wallet? So, for me, that time, kailang, um, ang psychological wallet pala is like, um, you have 100 pesos now. And then you want, you, you want a lot of, di ba? Like, a story of a driver, taxi driver or whatever, even a driver, who won a lot of. He, he won like 3 million pesos, no? Pero ang psychological wallet niya is 100 pesos. So anything in excess of that, he will spend it. So I, I na-realize ko na bat, bata pa lang ako na parang kailangan ng psychological wallet mo is yung um, enough na parang um, it should increase din also. No? So as I grow older, ini-increase ko yung psychological wallet ko. So you mean um, I learn how to spend wisely. I learn how to manage my finances early. Kasi kailangan ko mag-budget. Kailangan ko mag-budget para makatulong sa family ko. So I became a millionaire at age 23 but I was able to buy my my first property at age 29 because at that age dun na dun ko pa doon natapos sa college yung youngest sister ko. Kasi I have four more siblings younger than me. So, pinatapos ko muna lahat ng mga kapatid ko sa pag-aaral bago ko nag-invest sa sarili ko, bago, bago ko bumili ng gusto ko para sa sarili ko. That's how I took responsibility eh. So, I have this, this thinking na parang hindi ko kayang maging successful na ay na may nakikita ako ng mga kapatid ko, naghihirap, parang ganun. I think, parang for me, it will be dragging me down eh. So, Bago ko mag-move forward, kailangan ko muna um, tulungan yung mga kapatid ko. So, now, feeling ko, marami mga, kaib marami mga kaibigan ang sasabi na I'm living the life now. I'm living the life. Kasi they think na my life is so much easier now because um, so nakikita ng lifestyle ko. But, you know, um, I am truly grateful kasi nga Lahat ng mga kapatid ko ngayon, they're settled, they're stable, they, they have their own jobs. Parang feeling ko, um, na-achieve ko na kung ano man yung purpose ko sa buhay. Now that I have um, three kids, I have a family na, parang ready na ako and sa lahat ng mga pinagdaanan ko, parang ready na ako kung ano man yung pwede ko pang pagdaanan. And the, the, I, for me, the greatest challenge now is paano ko i-share, paano ko i- 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 kumbaga, paano kong hulmahin yung mga anak ko to be like me? Kasi, because as a mother, di ba, syempre, as a parent, we want to give the best for our child, no? So, when I, um, growing up, I didn't have a lot, no? Kulang ako sa lahat ng bagay, kulang ako sa attention, kulang ako sa finance, kulang ako sa lahat. Pero ngayon, ang mga anak, ang mga anak ko, parang everything is provided. So, when the greatest challenge for me is paano natin, paano ko i-empower yung anak ko na without spoiling them, without depriving them. And ganun din sa mga kaibigan ko, like, um, sa workplace ko, I'm gonna share the story of a friend, no? She's, she's also here, no? Uh, as a woman, nung nagtatrabaho na ako, I went into, nag nagbis ako ng, yan, yan, yung, yung secret number na parang, uh, ang mga nakakasalumuha ka, mga divers. Di ba? As a woman, parang hindi ako natakot na so what kung mga mga kasama ko, lalaki, mga divers na parang mga 
di ba? Medyo risky din. And then I went to, into telecom business na parang mga kasama ko dun, mga engineers. I'm an accountant. What do I know about engineering? What do I know about construction? And then, kaya itong isa kong friend na nandito siya, she's a nurse, no? And I met her when I worked sa uh, isang IT company. That time, I was already trading, stock trading, no? Doing stock trading. And I was already a millionaire. But I got bored. Sabi ko, so I, I was making money na, good money. But because, um, ano ako eh, physically active ako, parang gusto ko, I feel restless, kailangan meron akong ibang ginagawa. Parang it's not enough na meron akong isang pinagkakita, may isa lang akong ginagawa. Although this work doesn't pay enough, I have this, um, uh, ano naman, um, money coming from the stock investment. And uh, I went to a regular employment because I want to be busy. So na-meet ko tong uh, friend ko na nurse. And nung tinayo ko na yung telecom services, kinuha ko siya. And then sabi niya sa akin, Miss Ay naman, nurse ako, bakit naman ginawa mo ako accountant? Kasi startup business eh. So ginawa ko siya parang accountant, ginawa ko siya, pinapamanage ko siya ng books and everything. And then sa mga meetings namin with the engineers, sinasama ko naman siya, pinapamanage ko din naman siya doon. So, sabi niya, Miss Ay, nurse ako, ginawa mo ako accountant, naman ngayon, ngayon naman engineer ako. So I was telling her, naniniwala ako na you don't have to limit yourself. To your to what is your career or what is your profession? You can do anything. Sabi ko. Um, ganon din na. Uh, um, you can learn anything. Eh. It's possible for us to learn anything, whatever we want. Kung ano man yung focus natin, dahil ma ma achieve natin yun. It's limitless. Eh. Knowledge is limitless as long as you're willing to learn, de ba? And um, some advice also I give to my friends na. Ang problem naman kasi pag empowered ka, you're so strong. Sometimes people suffer on ano, ba? When you're you're strong in that aspect of your life, may mga bagay naman na weak ka. Like sa mga strong women, ang nang ang challenge sa kanila is yung relationship, relationship with the partner, ganon. Kasi mahirap din na oh because you're strong, parang um you're not you're not very willing to ano be submissive or uh, be controlled by your partner. But it's not about controlling me. It was empowering. It's all about balance. So, so nung time na, na na I met my partner, I was so independent. Yun ang naging problem namin. I was so independent. Na parang, ang sabi niya pa sa akin, ang yabang-yabang mo. Yun ang sabi niya sa akin, ang yabang-yabang mo. Because I did for me, hindi ko siya kailangan ni, eh. Parang sa gabal siya eh. Parang, so, he told me, ang hiyabang-hiyabang. But, ang daming, uh, ito na naman yung face ng boy ko, na dumating na naman ako sa isang challenging part na naman na parang how to manage a relationship. Sabi naman ng mga friend ko, away kami ng away, pero kayo naman yung pinakamatagal. Because a lot of my friends, sila yung mga, uh, ang, ang short na relationship nila, nagpakasal na, tapos naghiwalay na agad after three years. Ikaw yung reklamo ng reklamo about your partner, pero kayo yung pinakamatagal. Yun ang sabi ng mga friends ko. Kasi I think na importante din yun na parang nag-voice out my mga frustrations mo sa buhay, yung mga gusto mong sabihin. In, in that way, also na ma-manage mo din yung sarili mo. Then, um, dito pumasok yung um, interest ko in metaphysics, in life destiny. So, um, I learned about metaphysics, about destiny reading. Because as a woman, alam ko sa sarili ko na, you know, women are very inquisitive, eh, very curious. Eh. Gusto natin, lahat ng bagay alam natin. So, I went into metaphysics para mas maintindihan ko sa sarili ko, para mas maintindihan ko yung partner ko na uh, when we read destiny pala, uh, na 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 nalaman natin yung parang ating natal chart God's given um destiny so destiny may three parts yan so what is God's given to you yun yung birthday mo birth time mo how you were born in in this world no so that's all God's given to us no and then a part of it is karma how we live our life so 
na so kung paano tayo kung binless pa bin pinanganak tayo na nandito tayo sa magandang family but how we live our life also affects our fate our destiny no and third is yung sasabihin natin na earth lock so yung environment na na inalaw ay sa santa ay lumaki anyways um this um metaphysics or destiny reading somehow gave me um some sort of balance and peace of mind na as a strong woman kasi minsan gusto mo makipagtalo gusto mo makipag-argue gusto mo um panindigan yung niniwala mo but kailangan mo rin palang pakinggan yung other side so no so parang naging tool din sa akin yung destiny reading to understand people. So aside from their stories, aside from hearing their stories, so meron din tayong na meron din ako nakikita through destiny reading na uh, nakakatulong for me na magkaroon ng harmonious relationship with everyone. Uh, Eileen, I have a question. Hmm. Your story is really uh, moving and motivational. Hmm. Um, Women have multiple roles that you've actually um, um, shown, no? And your um, your understanding and um, your yeah you know, with your people in your workplace. What do you believe is the multi the the role the biggest and rewarding role that you think brought you where you are? The three roles I'm talking about is because you've mentioned it already in your life, because we still have one more speaker, no? Um, we have the reproductive, okay, productive. You became productive in your life. You've mm -hmm. mentioned that. And then reproductive, meaning to say now that you're starting a family relationship and about the community managing role. What mm -hmm. do you think is the most important? And secondly, and secondly, my last um, question to you is, I know and you've shown to us what you really love to do. Mm -hmm. Would loving what you do right now is supporting your family and making great money. Is this, you, is this what you think is empowering the best way to go in, um, in your role as a woman, as an empowered woman? Oh, for the first question, Doctora, um, the, the role you mean the being productive yes. and in the workplace, what is the most important for me? Yes. Again, Doctora, productive and uh, in the workplace. Reproductive and, and then community managing role. Because you did mention, because your, your life story is really encompassing all the roles of a woman. Mm. You become productive first, eh? Your story, your childhood stories, your all the anecdotal um, events in your life brought you to where you became productive. And mm. then when you became productive, you became reproductive. You now have a family and your relation it became relational. Now in terms of community, because what is it that you want to advise our audience in terms of this role? in the marketplace uh, considering the, the the story that or the experience that you went through uh, what um, is the core value or what you can share to us before we proceed to our last speaker i i doctor i believe na regardless of the situation regardless of how you were brought up kasi marami namang mga taong marami individual na they didn't go through what i had to go through Marami, sabi nga ni Dr. Villasor, uh, na this type of audience ngayon, this type of empowerment ngayon is different because yung ibang empowerment na natin is about uh, women that they were victimized and everything. Pero this type of audience, this type of um, discussion now is about, it's different, it's about different type of empowerment. So for me, um, regardless of the situation though, um it's very ano important na na kailangan focus kay 
kailangan alam mo kung ano yung gusto mo ma-achieve talaga sa buhay. And also, kailangan mo din mala- kailangan mo din um, uh, maging ready to also um, empower other people. Now, for me, like, every, I don't plan my life, eh, doctor. I don't plan my life. Every day, kung ano man ang challenge ko sa buhay, I face it. Parang, I handle it. Um, I think the, big, yeah, the biggest core value that you can actually uh, offer and advice is the self-strength. I think from yes. the very start that, yes, that, um, oh. that became the core value that brought you to where you are right now. Yes, so, so I, um, yes, Doc. Yeah, we will, we will um, you know, you actually are a thriver and that in itself, you not only survive, but you are a thriver. Okay, we will reserve the other questions after the last speaker. Okay, uh, can we move on for a while um, because, so that um, we can wrap up? Okay, so um, again, thank you, um, Eileen. Such a motivational um, story for, for many of us. Really, um, the sharing is really heartfelt. Congratulations, Talaga Eileen. So inspiring. So let's move on. Our third speaker. Many of you know, and many of you know who she is. She is a very famous interior designer. She planned her life as early as 12 years. She started as a junior draftsman, learning from mentors and from books. She lived in Los Angeles, California for 15 years where she honed her arts and her craft, made herself known and realized to be the only Asian or woman in her early career path. She decided to come back, start the practice. And now she has actually, she is a community influencer. She's a co-founder of the Atelier Almario she is a renowned international designer, renderer for the Ritz Carlton, Four Seasons, Rosewood, and Grand Hyatt projects worldwide. She's a soft, sought after designer for the development of top destination resorts, hotels, and high end residential projects in the Philippines. A world class product developer and designer with a cost through platforms that facilitate impact investments for the poor. She is a featured designer for the internationally acclaimed Interior Motives TV series. She's the most sought after speaker in design fora, schools and top real estate events. A prolific publisher of her design works in trade books, magazines and newspapers a recipient of the most outstanding professional interior designer award given by the professional regulations commission of the republic of the philippines current president of the philippine institute interior design an eminent interior designer a trailblazer creative impactful in all her ways look how beautiful she is compassionate and a seasoned mentor. Let us welcome my friends, Miss Ivy Almario. Ivy? Thank you so much. Hi. Good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for the time that you are giving us. Um, Nabi, thank you for uh, tapping me. Um, as as uh, Dr. Dido said earlier, let's put some context. Being the third speaker gave me the time to collect my thoughts. <laughs> and <laughs> because this is Women's Empowerment Month, uh, some of us, some of us, their fathers were the defining persons in their life. In my case, it was my mother and my aunt, Mirna Adrian. So um, you know me professionally as an interior designer. At 12 years of age, I knew I wanted to be an interior designer. My father's sister, Mirna Adriano, took up a course, correspondence, correspondence course with the New York School of Interior Design and started fixing up her place. 
at 12, I was so inspired. When I saw what she did to her house in Horseshoe, I said, this is what I'm going to be. This is what I'm going to be. And never, never veered away from that decision. So um, that was a no-brainer. I was one of the lucky ones who already knew at an early age what I wanted to be. What happened to me at 18 years, when I was 18 years old, again, that defined me. At 18 years old, my mother, 42 years old, with eight children, became a widow overnight. When my father perished in a plane crash at 45 years old. Understand that having eight children at 42 and losing the love of your life is very devastating for all of us. Because my father was charming. He was larger than life. He was a presence that, um, he was a very strong presence in our lives. And my mother was madly in love with him. Come on, eight children. What does that tell you, right? So, <laughs> but what it showed me was how a woman can transition for the love of her children. My mother, who was a practical, pragmatic businesswoman, because my father, who was a pilot, took care of the charm, the long being, the, 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 all the touchy feeling. My mom could afford to just be the pragmatic businesswoman. But she had eight kids who needed affection. So this cold, <laughs> She was cold at that time because she didn't have to, to flex her soft bones, her carina bones. She morphed. She morphed into this woman who became malambing, who reached out to all of us because that was also what we needed. So at 18, by ex experientially, I saw the power of love that we can change our personality, go deep into Areas that were not our comfort level because that's what the situation demands. The next woman that I'm going to mention because I was perhaps 21. So I graduated from the University of Santo Tomas with a uh, interior design degree. And I worked for six months for Sonia Santiago Olivares. She, is, uh, she was my first and only female boss she was my first and only Filipina boss. And Sonia was the one who taught me style. My mother is very stylish. And Sonia also was very stylish. I, I was just mentored by very stylish women. Uh, at that time, um, I, I, she was always in her very well quaffed and it that didn't matter if she went to the job site or she went to a meeting whatever she wore will take her to all the different roles she had to do for the day so i i kind of imbibed that um and then i left for the united states i didn't know i was going to stay there but i stayed for the next 15 years and that's where i really honed my craft um the power of a good thesis on a lark, the year before, my mom said, I, be, I was going to take the whole family to the States, you have a ticket. But I realized it's your thesis. So here's your ticket, you can take just a solo trip next year. So the next year, my mom said, I be your ticket's about to expire. What are you gonna do? I said, okay, mom, 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 I forgot, I forgot, I'll take it. And on a lark, I just brought my thesis. I said, what the heck, maybe I'll get a job, maybe not. So on the first week, I called up a friend. I said, Paco, can you, you know, I kind of want to work. He said, okay, go over across the street, talk, talk to Luis Pereira and show your stuff. I showed my stuff. And the next question that I was asked was, could you start next week? So the power of a good portfolio, the power of putting your mind to what you really love is recognized even at an early age. So there I was gainfully employed in America. 
And then my boyfriend who was in the Philippines followed. And, um, and then we married and we had uh, careers. He was an architect and I was an interior designer. So what uh, was my next defining moment? My next defining moment was um, having children, of course, while balancing work in America. Um, not, I'm now happily married a second time around. So what am I telling you? The first time was not a success. It takes two to tango. I'm very careful about what I say about this past relationship, but I will come with full disclosure um, as diplomatically as I can. We were very much in love when we married, but we perhaps did not have the skill sets to stay together. So what was one of our first challenges as a married couple? We lost our firstborn child in a still, it was, a, it was, the baby was born, stillborn. But then um, as it happened, um, I also almost lost, lost my life because it was septicemia. And um, I only knew I almost lost my life because I had a near-death experience. And that forever changed my life. I'm not going to talk about the near-death experience. I'm just going to say that the near-death experience and me seeing a peak of the beautiful afterlife is what up to now sustains me when I have difficulties. It's what made me accept the death of my firstborn child. It's what made me accept the reality of a difficult marriage. Um, we thrived in the United States because, and I want to share this because this is an empowerment story. So one of the things my mother always told me was, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be, to, to, to never, to always have been living in homes. I, I, I was never in a rental, even your dad. You know, I lived with your with my mom, Apo, when I couldn't afford. And then when we could afford, we lived in Blue Ridge. My prayer for my children, Sana, when you guys have your own children, you will also have your own homes. So that was my mindset. So, 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 so we acquired the house. I gave, I gave birth to my second son and, all seemed to be rosy. But again, it wasn't rosy. Um, I um, became a very successful rendering artist by accident. Remember, I was an interior designer, but when my firstborn child, because of the stillborn, I was very fragile and I couldn't work full time. So I had to work on a part-time basis. And I called my friend, Butch, you know, the Filipino community abroad is very tight, very tight and very supportive. At some point, when you're not yet successful, that dynamics changes once you become successful because then there could be crab mentality. But at the start, everything is wonderful and cozy and very supportive. So yeah, she said part-time here, you know, we're doing the four seasons in Los Angeles, come, come. So I interviewed and there's a Filipino mafia wherever you go, trust me. At that time, especially for me, all the all the all the uh, heads, of course, were the white, uh, were the Americans, right? But behind that, all the all the brains and all the hardworking people were Filipinos. At least in the creative industry, I noticed the same in the. I, I couldn't but help it, but every time I visited, there were also always Filipino nurses. We seem to dominate the service industry in the creative industry. Why am I telling you this? Because right away I was hired again. I just showed my portfolio and I was hired, but they were laughing at me because Butch Del Rosario said, show me what you can do. He gave me a detail to do a cabinet and I detailed it, fine. But then he laughed. He said, you're not ever going to last in my department. I said, yeah, what did I do wrong? You don't have to render a nail ivy. You don't have to put shade and shadows in nails. She said, Ay, ho, what will I do with you? So I said, you have to move to the presentation department. And I didn't know then that the boss was in Paris shopping, Louis Catafo, and they just told me to do these wonderful elevations for the four seasons in Los Angeles because nobody told me any better. I merged two things I love the most, 
fashion and interior design since I was just entertaining myself. Anyways, I thought, what the heck? So I did a, all my elevations will feature an elevation is a, it's not, it's, it's, it's a one dimensional drawing and like a perspective, it's three dimensional. Okay, so I showed, I showed bell hops, I showed women in gowns, I showed husbands and wife dining, I showed shoppers, I animated my drawings and thought nothing about it. I didn't even think that I was reinventing the wheel. I was just enjoying myself and giving my 100% to the work that was at hand. So the next day when the pre I asked them, oh, okay, how was the presentation? Remember, I was just freelancing. And then they said, oh my God, you blew Lewis's head. I said, Whoa, what did I do? Oh my God, he went crazy when he saw your presentation. He rented a ballroom instead of a meeting room. I said, what's his business? Renting a ballroom and he just has to present something. And then they said, because he had your drawings blown up. So they were nine feet long and four or five feet high. And he filled the ballroom with your drawings. I said, oh my God, wow, wow. Overnight, a career was born because the next day my phone will not stop ringing off the hook. And then I, before I knew it, I was doing renderings for the top interior designers, first in the United States and then some in Europe and then some in Asia. So that I, um, I, I had to purchase a building in Beverly Hills because my accountant told me, you need to have a tax shield. I said, oh, okay. So I did this for 10 years. The uh, top designers in the world, because California, Los Angeles then was the creme de la creme for hospitality, became my good friends. So right now, up to now, Hirsch Bedler, if you Google it, still comes up as number one all over the world for hospitality. So what am I saying you? I was one of the few lucky ones who actually met and worked with Howard Hirsch and Bill and Michael Bettner. And one day I was pinching myself because I had Howard Hirsch in my office in Beverly Hills talking to me about the Beverly, uh, the Beverly Hills Hotel renovation that, that I was uh, drawing with my partner, Michael Hackett. So those, th there are some things you never forget. Um, why am I sharing uh, this story with you? Because at the age of 33, I owned a house in Bel Air and a um, building in Beverly Hills. We had two maids, his and hers, Mercedes Benzes, but a very sad marriage. You can only lie to yourself up to a certain point, and then you realize what you exactly doing, right? There was one day for one reason or the other, my husband again was unhappy. And at 33, I realized the man I married does not have a happiness barometer. And for me, that was a rude awakening because we were only 33. We had the best zip codes in the world. Help in America when you had to do everything yourself. So we were spoiled. Food was wasted because we couldn't go home to eat meals. We were always in our office and the cook will prepare. And by all accounts and purposes, we should be so happy but we were so miserable because he was always finding something wrong about the situation. Um, to the point that I told myself, I have to move this guy to the Philippines or I will not be able to survive. So we talked about it and I said, how about we open a design office in the Philippines? Not, no, 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 I, a rendering office because I need help. There is just so much work. I cannot do it. And oh, he trooped to the Philippines. We opened a beautiful office. And that was the salvation for a while of the marriage because of the distance. 
So for three years, I commuted until one time, one day he said, when are you ever going to join me in the Philippines? That was not even in my plan. My plan was just get him out of my hair and survive my marriage. So, uh, oh, I said, okay, if we get the Manila Hotel, the grand dam of all hotels, I promise I'm going to go back to the Philippines with you. Then he says, oh, the Manila Hotel is up for grabs. Okay, I said, okay. We mounted the presentation out of our Los Angeles office and shipped it to the Philippines. We competed with 11 foreign firms. And then I get the phone call, the dreaded phone call. We won. What? <laughs> We won. I said, well, of course I pretended to be happy while my heart sank because I had to live my cushy life in the States, go back to the Philippines. I do not know about you ladies, but my word is my bond. Somehow, we, are, we seem to be wired that way. So, I moved back to the Philippines and started the business. But then um, the dynamics had changed. The dynamics had changed. I was now pregnant with my third son. I was very fragile. I was very lazy as most pregnant women are lazy. And then I realized that I didn't want to keep the show in America running while I was, we were doing a new show with the Philippines. So, you know, I made the tough decision. Is it my sanity? or my properties, because I was the engine that propelled that business in America. And I said, the moment I stop working, that whole empire will collapse. Because remember, that's life in America. You need, you, you are trained to acquire debt as a consequence of your success. But then I said to myself, fine, I will lose the building, I will lose everything I worked for in America because I had abused myself. I had worked so hard that there was one morning I told myself, even if you paid me a million dollars, I will not do a rendering for you. I can no longer draw a pretty picture. And all of my friends who were the top people in the industry panicked. They all called me. And I said, I'm so sorry. I would rather keep you as a friend than get a phone call from you asking me, what happened, dear? Why aren't you in your element? I said, I've worked too hard to submit work that I'm not proud of. You may not be able to tell it, but I will know. And I would rather keep our friendship and quit at the top of my game. So that's what I did, a very tough decision. Years later, I asked a business guru, what did I do wrong? Why did that American dream collapse and blow up in my face? I worked hard, I paid taxes, I hired people, I gave opportunities. I mean, really gave opportunities that changed life. We sponsored so many green cards for Filipino, um, Creatives, you know, changed lives, right? And then he said, because you only worked hard, you didn't play hard. Okay, so ladies, I'm telling you, recipe for burnout, only work hard. If you want to sustain it, play hard. <laughs> Learn it the hard way. So when we went back to the Philippines and I heard <laughs> I, I had my third child, the marriage was in its last leg. Marriage was in its last leg. What is the what was the reality, the different reality? And I'm gonna be blunt. This is a sisterhood, but sometimes the sisterhood doesn't work out. The Filipino women. There was just too much, um, too many candies in a tray. <laughs> um, when you want. When you want to end your marriage, a marriage doesn't end unilaterally. It has to be bilateral. It, it limped along for a long time because we just loved working with each other. We were two creatives who just enjoyed working with each other. 
So that saved us for a while. Went until one time my mother sat me down and my mother, this strong woman sat me down and said, I can see that you're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I said, okay. I said, okay, Ivy, let me tell you this. I have seen daughters of my friends who indulged in a little nervous breakdown. They're never the same again. You do not indulge in a little nervous breakdown. You just do not. So my mother said, you do not need a husband as much as your children need a mother. You do not need a husband as much as your children need a mother, she said. My Catholic Sarado mother then said, she never told me to leave my husband. No, that decision had to be mine, right? So she said, in life, you will reach a fork. One, road will give you darkness. Another road will give you light. And she said, Ivy, always choose light. Always choose the light at the end. And I said, oh, okay, mom. That's all she said. But my mother, being my mother, also had the last word. Because I could see you're on your way to becoming to become, you're on your way to be traded in anyways for a newer model. I said, <laughs> I said mom, she said, yeah, I, it's in the cards. I could say, I could tell. I said, okay, okay. So what did my family do? Because they had seen me suffering for the last decade. They had seen my unhappiness. Every single day, one of them will call me. And they only fessed up when it was all over. And remind me about, you know, did I did this to you? I grab it. How could you forget? And then the next day, ah, a sister will visit. Huh? How could you survive when he did this to you? Huh? So, 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 ah, so I was always, you know, I was always being reminded how it was no longer a tenable relationship. And then I made the decision. I made the decision. I said, the next woman who wants my husband, I will gift her. I will gift her with him. I will look, observe. She will just inherit my problems. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. When the third woman walks into our conjugal life, I stood back and I just said, she is not my enemy. She is my liberator. And silently, I blessed her. Because painful as it was, I knew her role in my life. Now, when I romanticized this to my mother, ha, she will not put up with S-H-I-T like that, she will say, okay, Ivy, she still wrecked your marriage. No matter how you sugarcoat it, she still wrecked a marriage. It's like, okay, mom, yeah, yeah, got it, got it. <laughs> but what does that tell you? What does that tell you? A Filipina will sacrifice for her children. Because when I was having the final conversation with my ex-husband, this is what I said. I said, even if in the last two years, I had begged you every day if we could end this marriage because it was just so difficult, so difficult. And you always told me, Catolico Sarado, married for life. I said, now that my children who are only at that time, seven years old and one and a half years old. I said, now that my children will actually come from a broken home, 
I will just be the one to sacrifice. There were no, I have yet to say more painful words. For me, I've never said more painful words in my life because tatagalugin ko na. What it meant was magsasakripisyo na lang ako, kakayanin ko yung mga kalukohan mo, magtitiis na naman ako kasi ayoko lang malait yung anak natin at sabihin niya, ha, yan, yoko, yung asawahin niyan, pamilya niyan, wala. This was Manila in the 90s. It's not the Manila now. That was the context. My children were going to Southridge. You know, I mean, that was the context. And I held my breath because whatever he was going to say was a death sentence for me. And I was walking to my grave. And he says to me, too late chocolate, I no longer love you. So I am, um, part of me was so relieved and part of me was, uh, um, amused, and part of me, of course, was shocked. Not shocked. Uh, the cavalier man was. It was perhaps a fitting epitaph to a marriage that should have died long enough. That cavalier dismissal of me just tells you a lot. So I moved on, and I established. Uh, you can still hear me. Sorry. Yes. I think okay. Go ahead. Go so, ahead. Sorry. So that, that, that you know, and, and, you know, part of me was very relieved. I, have a, I had a life. Part of me was saying, yabang talaga nito, deep inside me. If I may say a Philippine word, G-A-G-O, gago. I said, to say, to say that to me, hello. Right? And then part of me was just, just had a very, very uh, poker face. And I said again, when the boys are grown and they ask, who wanted out in the marriage. Fair to say when push come, when push came to shove, you were the one who wanted out. And he said, yeah, me. He said, okay. So that's how my, 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 my marriage of uh, 13 years, he was my boyfriend for seven. So that's how a 20 year relationship ended on one Sunday afternoon. I just called my helpers and I said, load all the clothes of sir in his car. And that was it. Um, and then um, I only, I'm a very private person. I just want to share with you the power of choice because every time you say a yes, it also means you're saying a no. When I said, yes, I will love myself more. What was I saying? I was saying uh, no, no more denigration. No, I no longer have to hide my light under a bushel. Mm -mm. I will raise my children so that my daughters-in-law will never have to come to me crying. Like the way I went to my mother-in-law to explain to me why my husband is such. I promise myself, it's for this very reason that I have sons, that I will make single motherhood succeed for my future daughters-in-law. So that was my rallying point. Another thing that I picked up the phone and I called all of my relatives and I told them, you know my life story. We are all very close. We are a very tight family. I can only wash my dirty laundry with you to survive this marriage, but I'm asking you this favor. If I ever hear anything bad about my ex-husband, I said, I will be very disappointed in all of you. Because remember, my sons have to bear that last name with dignity. And I will be the very last person to destroy the, that for my sons. They have to dignify that last name. Another lesson I'm teaching you ladies, it's very easy to go low, but when you realize what matters most, go high. Paraphrasing Michelle Obama. And my children know this, my sons know this. 
you know, and they know it. Um, and I am very happy. The next man in my life, I chose purposefully. And this was my criteria. That man has to be able to show my boys how to cherish a woman. Because that is something they can never get from their father. It, at that point in his life, it was not in him. I'm being just real. We are all developmental. I'm not going to say he was never going to grow those cherishing bones. I have no idea if he did. But at that point in time, my sons were never going to get that from him. And since I had custody of children, I had to show them by example, what a working relationship was. So the man I married cherishes me and my children grew up seeing that. So they had another template to use when they had their, when they had their own relationships. So let's spark that and let me move to my professional relationship. When I told you about my success as a rendering artist in the States, what I didn't tell you was I was the only Asian and I was the only female renderer at that time who was getting top dollars and my calendar was booked three months, a hundred days in advance. It had become a joke. If I wanted to see a movie, even that was calendar. It also had become pathetic because I had all the money in the world to spend, but I would call my friends and say, could you please go to Beverly Center and find me the most beautiful Christmas tree? and just make sure it's in my house by this time. Um, success has its highs, it also has its lows. So when I chose to say goodbye to that, there were no regrets. Why? Because I told myself, I did this in my 30s, heck, I could do this again in my 40s or in my 50s. That success did not, was not, anything that did not come out of my hard work, my dedication and my passion, it's still in me. So what have I to be afraid of? But you know, what I didn't realize when I went to the Philippines was I had become an amazing interior designer. Why? By osmosis. If your clients are the best in the world and you are their computer and you have to translate their solutions, for them into beautiful drawings, I had the best PhD. And that was what I did. I pivoted from a renderer to an interior designer. And now to cut a long story short, I partnered with my sister, Cynthia. Um, we are considered to be one of the uh, 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 seasoned designers in the Philippines. Um, last, last, early last, Late last year, I, I was asked by Sonia Santiago Olivares, who's still my friend, whom I look up to. She calls me up and she says, I'm going to nominate you for the PIID, a bullet that I had dodged for 12 years. I had no choice, but I said, Shh, but, uh, uh, okay, okay. And then, and then I, I, uh, I got elected. So now, uh, now I'm, I'm helming a design organization. Um, we kept our practice purposefully boutique. What we had learned from our hard life in America was to balance family and mm -hmm. career. Um, remember, interior design is a very funny business because you only have, this is, this is the tiering in interior design. Owner or Owner, senior designer, junior designer, intern. <laughs> there are only four. <laughs> there are only four tiers. <laughs> oh, so 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 because you you know I mean, it's a creative industry. It's a creative industry, and 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 so um that's where I am. So I I I will cut it short. Um, very happy with interior design. Um. It's the only profession where people pay you and pay you well to spend their money, <laughs> to spend their money grandly. <laughs> 
So thank you very much. I hope I was able to share with you uh, this particular woman's journey to the sisterhood. <laughs> Wow, Ivy, Eileen, I love your stories. They're so inspiring, really. I just like to know, Eileen, Ivy, is there anything at a moment in your life right now that you can tell yourself that you've done enough? I, 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 I think I can. Also, <laughs> only because of my age. <laughs> I'm already unapologetic if I already say um, contentment. You know, the gift of my near-death experience is the gift of contentment. I realized that God didn't expect anything from me, but every single day to feel his love. I was not ever going to impress him, but because why? Why impress the creator of the universe? I mean, like, it's not even in the books, right? So... All I felt was love. And so every single day, I just breathe in love for what I do for the people who are around me. And I have nothing more to prove to myself because every day I show up to this life 100%. Even if I'm showing up at 60, I can tell myself, that's fine because you already did overtime. You already <laughs> you've proven your stripes. So <laughs> kindness, kindness to myself is, is a gift also of being more mature, the gift of being more mature that you've lived many seasons in your life is knowing that you were given this deck of cards, you had many choices, these were your choices. So happiness is really just all about making your choices work for you. Thank you. How about you, Eileen? Is yes, Doctor. Can say you've done enough. Yes, Doctor. I, I am at the moment na on stage ng buhay ko na I I can say na I've done enough because um I've seen my family members doing well. Uh, I I no longer feel any fear for my children because na, na um for me um they also. Every person has to go through challenges in their life. So I, I, I cannot fear for my children na ayoko mag-suffer sila or anything. But parang feeling ko, um, kahit ano pa ibigay sa akin ng panahon, ng Diyos, ng, ng destiny or ng life, kahit, kahit ano pang pagdaanan ko, I'm ready na. I'm, I, I mean, kaya ko na. And, and doon ako sa stage na meron akong peace of mind, na-explain ko na sa sarili ko lahat ng mga bagay na nangyari at mga pwede pang mangyari. So, I remember meron akong kaibigan na nagtanong sa akin, um, do you fear death? Mm -hmm. So, ang sagot ko, I don't challenge death. Pero, um, I'm ready to die. Parang ganun. So, hindi ka, hindi ka pwede mabuhay na, na lagi like, may fear for others eh. Um, Kaya basta ano lang, basta ano, naniniwala lang ako doon na parang eh, kailangan lang natin gawin kung ano yung kaya natin gawin. As long as um, meron tayong buhay, and, um, kung anong kaya natin gawin at present. Le um, na, uh, I learned also how to manage my frustrations so I don't expect too much. So I can ano, na parang na manage ko na yung expectations ko and wala ka rin yung frustrations sa buhay. So, uh, I'm at peace. Yun ang masabi ko, Doctor. I'm at peace at the moment. That's good. Yeah. Kindness, peace. How about you, darling, Athena? Hello. Can you say you've done enough? No. The so, so, <laughs> rope is long. <laughs> I can't, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a, um, a, a very big question. Um, I, I don't really know what the answer is, but I, if I feel that I am not doing enough, you know, there are, I put things into context and I try to remind myself that whatever situation I'm in, you're doing the, I'm doing the best that I can. Um, I think that's something that we, I personally struck, you know, I think we are our harshest critic in anything and women most especially. Um, but, you know, you just have to be honest with yourself. And so, I do think that I, whatever circumstance I am in, I am just trying to do my best. 
Okay, um, for the three of you, um, there is something before um, I ask. What do you think, can you give your comments about this? Whatever stage you are in your life, you may not change the beginning, but you can certainly try to start where you are now and change the ending. Do you agree, Tita Ivy, Eileen, and Athena? So let's do this uh, not age before and uh, <laughs> start from the youngest and I will <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> Athena. Can you put the picture up again? Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Here. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, um, yeah, I think um what I'm like what I mentioned earlier, you know, um, unless it was something that you if you go through something that you've never experienced, I really think that all of us go through different seasons of life. And so whatever season we are faced with, I, depending on whether we've experienced it before, I do believe that we don't start from scratch. We start from experience. So I do agree in that sense with what this, this quote is saying. Yeah, wonderful to say. How about you, Eileen? Oh, can't hear you. Yes, okay, Doc. So, okay. yes, I believe, Doc, na, um, yes, you cannot change the beginning, yes, Doc. Naniniwala ako, I believe na you cannot change the beginning, but, uh, for, and for me, whatever happened in the past, it, it, it definitely shaped me up. So, um, you can always start kung ano man meron ngayon so and change change the ending so you can always ano eh it's always it all depends on you eh it all depends on yourself how you um how you want to um live the rest of your life no wonderful okay it's the ivy the season <laughs> one <laughs> The season one, <laughs> the designer for all seasons. <laughs> Let me just uh, share with you a conversation I had with my my mother, my gorgeous mother. When I say gorgeous, she's just one of those physically endowed. Maganda lang siya talaga babae. So she's really aside from being beautiful in and out. So I told her, Mom, um, how 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 old are you? I mean, what? age are you feeling right now? I'm not asking about your chronological age, but today as we speak, how young are you? She says, well, there are some days, there are some days I'm 18, but now I'm feeling 21. Wow! <laughs> I get it. And I, every day, I get it. Because every day, um, the question, um, every day gives us a choice. Every day is a choice. Um, this last pandemic, people tell me, you, 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 you look even lovelier post-pandemic than pre-pandemic. I chose to be part of the population who will use the next two years to physically reboot. Why? Because I told myself the only way we all know the Philippine health system is very challenged. And my husband and I just said, why are we going to be part of the statistic when we have the only, our only responsibility is to be at our healthiest so we do not add to the problem. So with a mindset where you're always looking to be a part of the solution, yeah. Every day becomes a possibility for that. Okay. Thank Perfect. You. Galing. Okay, before we, we run and get um, our Tardido's um, last comments, one advice. What brief advice can you tell, like for Athena? Um, what advice can you give Okay, regarding workplace for women at their workplace, Athena. 
how do you do well at work as a woman? Um, we have a lot of people in their workplace, okay, yeah. right now. Can you hear me? Think, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. There's a question of what simple things can make you happy. Okay. Yeah, so I think for Tim, me... I can't hear you. Can you guys hear me now? Hello? Can you hear me? Can't hear you. Yes. Oh, I can we hear can you. Hear you. We can hear you. Can't hear you. Oh, okay. Your mama, mommy, your mommy cannot. <laughs> I, um, well, so I was just. No, now you're going. Uh, you're Alina, we can't hear you, Neither darling. Me. Yeah, no. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, they can hear me, mom. They can hear me. Never mind. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh -huh. Help. The one thing for, I, I think, Wait, just from a work perspective work perspective is learning how to set boundaries that I think is very Can you hear her yes 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 we can hear her yes we can hear her. yes we can hear yes. her we yes. can <laughs> sorry um anyways what I was saying was you have to in especially for women in the workplace we have to set healthy boundaries you have to think about what is in your best interest women also have to stop apologizing so much. And I am the first person who is very guilty of that, especially in a male dominated industry, I tend to over apologize. Um, remind ourselves to be kind, especially to also other women, um, you know, speak up and speak up for yourself and speak up for other women and advocate for yourself. And I think especially in this day and age, you should, we should also, you know, look to people who can serve as our mentors or pe look for people who are, who take an and who support you. Um, I guess one last like practical thing that I was thinking of, mom, stop, mom, stop muting me. <laughs> stop muting me. <laughs> um, the last the the last piece is just in general i think wherever we work or whoever we work with we as women need to familiarize ourselves with the resources the tools that are available um so that we can have the confidence to know you know because we need we don't tend to speak up in general but if you are aware like if you have the knowledge let's just say one example for me, my health, if I knew that there were whatever the leave program was, or if I do have, in, if I have a family in the future, what the maternity policy is, having those pieces of knowledge can really empower women and empower like us, because, you know, no, that will give us the confidence to ask for what are things that will be most ben beneficial and what would be in their best interest. So I think that's just like a practical tip that I don't know is very applicable to the women here who are all more seasoned than I am. But I think, you know, for your daughters or for whoever it is, especially now when we're all in a male dominated industry, we have to support each other. So we have to provide each other with the tools or, you know, give each other tips on how to navigate the situation. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Athena, I didn't hear anything you said. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry. Sorry, but we yeah, heard her. I know. That's, all, that's, that's okay. We heard her. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's important that you heard her. Okay, how about you, Eileen, with regards to the marketplace? What advice can you give? Um, well, um, with regards to the marketplace, um, as a woman, I, I you have to see yourself as um, equally or at par with with everyone, with even a man. No, you can do anything, uh, and you do not uh, try not to limit yourself, um, and change your mental um your your thinking that I have to be prepared for this or 
this should be how I uh, this should be how I, uh, I have to plan doing uh, to do this. Kailang kailangan alam mo lang kung uh, how to blend in. Kahit surrounded ka ng mga ng ng uh, you're in a uh, male dominated industry. Uh, like Atina said, the resources are available. You can always empower yourself with all the resources, with all the knowledge. You can. Uh, it's um, it's always healthy to ask, and it's always healthy to um, ask for advice and ask for help. No, you don't have. You don't have to be um, embarrassed or shy, uh, or feel um, less if you you ask for um, for help. No. Just stay in the game, you know. And don't don't lose hope and don't um don't don't give up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um <laughs> <laughs> yes, Doctor. I see Miss Ivy na. I think you're on mute. You're on mute. You're mute, Nabi. Okay. Sorry. So, I, would, I would imagine <laughs> it should be me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's you. Sorry, I was on mute. Oh boy. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Hi, so, Nako. So the question, of course, is still the same. No, uh, my advice for women in the workplace, right? It should be. No, you're, yeah, the same. Community yeah, this same. time in a bigger scope. Community. Ah, community. Okay. 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 Um, the biggest community kasi that I'm involved now and working with, mostly through osmosis, but I'm also a founding member, is at Agrea. It's the farming community and the fisher folks. And most of this that I'm going to share with you uh, and from lots of conversations I, I hold uh, and listen to with, uh, I call her my daughter because she, she, she may not be my daughter from my womb, but she's a daughter from my heart. So Cherry and I always discuss this and Cherry will always say, Mommy, you know, sa Filip in the Filipino context, ang talagang kailangan natin empower yung mga women. Kasi sadly, I've seen it sa gawad kalinga pa lang nakita ko I-intrega, imbis na intrega yung sweldo pag Friday sa misis, ilinalasing ng mga lalaki. So, the sad, tas bubugbugin pa yung wife sa weekend. So, I, I would just, you know, this, this may not be the fishbowl that's relevant to us, but I just, I just want to share why it's so important for all of us to table education. Values formation. Those are the non-negotiables. And empowerment in every way that it gets to us. In my own house, we have one rule. There is no poverty in our house. What does that mean? Kung ang kasambahay ko, pagpasok sa akin, may anak, I educate the children like I would educate them. In my age, it's already my apo. And you know, because that's one life that we are changing. So whenever you are presented opportunities where you can use empathy, compassion, kindness, and listening, listening skills. I have to be a great listener because I'm an interior designer. Listening, please, let's remember um, we are in this sisterhood to be with each other. And we have so many, many of our other sisters who are not as educated as us who were born so challenged that some, it's, it's not a bad idea to get out of our comfort zone and embrace the community, as Nabi says. Wonderful, great, inspiring again. So we have to wrap up. Where is our dear Dido? Dido, are Dido. you here? Dido! I'm back. <laughs> oh, sorry. yeah, you got cut. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> some of you. 
Dido, what can you say? How can you, we'd like to hear from you, hearing all our stories, all our exchanges, what can you say? I'd like to thank uh, uh, Athena, Eileen, and Ivy. Thank you for sharing your sacred story. It's really sacred, you know what I mean? And, and so, and, and your sacred journey, everybody has a sacred journey. I am at awe with how you have, uh, you have navigated. You know? And if you just listen to yourself, I don't know, maybe you've rehashed this over and over in your minds, but if you hear your journey from where we are seated, we can see that you are truly blessed. Each of you was given some kind of grace to be able to navigate through it. Not everybody who would have give, been given the same um, trials. It's truly a heroine's journey. No? In psychology, we talk about the hero's journey. It's truly a heroine's journey what you went through. And in every path, you were given some kind of challenge, some kind of um, silent helpers, you know what I mean? Some kind of dragons to slay. And you were able to do it. No? And so I just like to congratulate you. And now you're coming back with a pearl of great price. And so I have nothing to say except go on. And now you're going to go and share it some more. No? So what to see that was so important was it was so important because you had helpers. Was it your family? Was it you had challenges? It could have been your cancer. It could have been your trickster which in the case of Ivy, it was her husband. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> the in the case of Eileen, it was her setbacks of her early business. You know what I mean? And then in the case of Athena, it was her illness. But then again, you were able to surpass it. So it, it's really just so, so impressive. Thank you again for sharing. And again, I want to again emphasize with the Filipino woman, the context. The context is so important because in every step of the way, hindi ka nag-iisa. In fact, in the case of Eileen, sila ang hindi nag-iisa dahil sa'yo. Yan. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hindi, hindi mo naisip yun. Hindi mo sila iniwan. Hindi mo naisip, lalo na hindi mo naisip kahit na mag-isa ka doon, pumupunta ka doon sa mga sea urchin. Maling mo ba kung ano yung sea urchin na yun? Yes. <laughs> you know what? Hindi mo naisip yun because you're thinking of your siblings. In the case mm -hmm. of Ivy, you really reach the top of the line. And then, here was your trickster husband who told you, come home. And so you came home, not thinking, oh, what's gonna be in the future? Yung pala, that was where the journey was going to begin. In the case of Athena, her future was so clear. Then here comes the cancer, you know? Then what is the path? So I think, I just want to quote Jung, nothing happens by chance. And now the path is going to open again for you. So that's all I have to share. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Wait, wait, Nako, Dido, I want to hug you. I want to hug you. Thank you very much. Hugs to all. Can you please turn on your videos? Because we're going to take a picture, a photo. Hello. Ready, ready. Turn on your photos, please. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. One, two, three. Another. Turn on your photos, your videos. Another one. Everyone, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello, hello. Turn Hi. on your videos, Annalisa, Wang, Joanne. One, two, three, go. And then another, the third. Turn on your videos, please. Nako, everybody's getting ready. Okay. Put on your lipstick. Just smile. Smile. <laughs> Show that you are a woman that's inspired and empowered by today's webinar. 
Go, one, two, three. Okay. So everybody, thank you. Thank you very much. It was really an inspiring story. I mean, more morning, it's already midday. So I don't know what else to say, except I'm really at awe that this thing really is happening and it just all fall, fell into place. Ivy, I never knew your, your story and I'm so inspired. Eileen, I didn't know also the, the details of all the anecdotes that you were sharing. Of course, Athena, I'm so proud of you, darling. I'm really so proud of you. Move on. Whoa. So if, um, is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, you'd like to share? Uh, we're in awe, everybody. I think if you want, if you need to leave, yes, you can leave. If you want to say and and just chit chat and share whatever, I'm willing to to listen here, um, unless we can say goodbye. And um, again, I'd like to thank all those who have joined us this morning. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Um, and uh, I hope to see you in the next webinar. Okay, please join us, continue to inspire and empower women. As Michelle Obama said, there's nothing that will limit us because we are women. Yes, the best man to the job is a woman. Go, go, go. Dido, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Wow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Nabi. Thanks, Bye. Nabi. Bye -bye. Thanks, Nabi. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mamita. Oh, Hermie, love you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye, everyone.